A very good morning to all of you. We have come to almost the final session of the research methodology course being organized by IPE, supported by SRC ICSSR. We have here uh, today the chairman of this session, Professor Kamai Garu. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, accepting to chair the session on doctoral colloquium. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Kamai Garu. Professor Kamai Garu is a Dean School of uh, Economics, uh, University of Hyderabad. And formerly, he worked with National Institute of Bank Management, Pune, as Associate Professor. And he has held several positions in SAP, ASIS coordinator, coordinator, and Head Department of Economics, University of Hyderabad. And he is also head RBI Endowment Unit, Isaac Bangalore. He has uh, several, he is a member on uh, several bodies. He is a member of uh, Board of Studies, academic referee to several journals, and a member of advisory boards of several journals. His areas of interest include monetary and financial economics, applied time series analysis, macroeconomics, international finance. He has published about 140 papers in national and international journals and he has guided about 40 PhD dissertations. He also guided 46 MPhil dissertations and more so, we work very closely with uh, Professor Kamai Garu. He is uh, also a mentor to many of the faculty in IPE whenever we implement any projects uh, when we want to apply any econometric tools, uh, we seek the guidance uh, from Professor Kamai Garu. He is an authority in applying economic, uh, econometric models. We have uh, learned a bit about uh, application of econometric models uh, as part of your research methodology course. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Kamai Garu with us. And uh, let us give a big uh, round of applause to <laughs> Professor Kamai Garu. We welcome him. And uh, Professor Anand Akundi, you all know him uh, by now. He is a senior faculty in IPE. And uh, he also worked with uh, several national and uh, international bodies. Uh, he has uh, worked on the project supported by UN, ADP, and UNICEF. Recently, he got a very huge project uh, which was supported by ICMR. Uh, he is an authority in applying qualitative tools in uh, uh, in research. We welcome uh, Dr. Anand Akundi. Thank you very much, uh, Anand, for accepting our invitation and to be the co chair for this technical session. So, Professor Janaki and Professor Anand and other colleagues from IP and students and friends, I have a great pleasure to be here with you today in connection with the doctoral colloquium. I am happy that <clears throat> there are about uh, 10 scholars who are presenting their you know, research work. And uh, we will try our best to go through the proposals and give some useful comments to all of you. So without, you know, <clears throat> losing any time further, yeah, yeah, so let us now take up uh, one by one. I hope all the ten are present. Hmm? Okay. So in serial order, I will call them. And uh, I think each candidate would get about uh, 20 minutes. Yeah, 15 to 20 minutes. So now first let me invite uh, Yeah, um, Ambili Jayachandra, School of Management. Yeah, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, respected dignitaries on the dais, and of the dais, and my fellow research scholars, let me introduce myself uh, before going into the presentation. I am Ambili Jayachandra, and I am doing research under the University of Kerala, Department of Commerce. The title of my research is Implications of Asian Monetary Unit on the Indian business environment, a feasibility study. And I am doing my research under the guidance of Dr. C. Ganesh, 
professor and former head of the Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. Now before going into a detailed presentation, let me give you a brief account of the major events uh, which reflects the relevance of my research. Now in 1997, the, there was an Asian monetary crisis which affected almost all of the Southeast, Southeast Asian nations and the result was devaluation of many of the Southeast Asian currencies. Now this crisis led to the formation of Xi'an Mai in, uh, initiative which was formed by the ASEAN. Now under the Xi'an Mai initiative, the main purpose of Xi'an Mai initiative was to bring in a coordinated efforts of uh, coordinated exchange rate, uh, exchange rate policies among the Southeast Asian nations. And, uh, and as a result of this initiative, Asian Monetary Unit was formed. Now currently Asian Monetary Unit is used as a statistical tool and it was formulated by the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry. The main purpose of Asian Monetary Unit is, uh, is to act as a surveillance criteria for coordinating the exchange rate policies among the East Asian countries. Now what is Asian Monetary Unit? Asian Monetary Unit is basically a common currency basket which is computed by taking the weighted average of the currencies and it is compared against, it is uh, denoted against the weighted average of US dollar and Euro. It is uh, and the calculation of, uh, and AMU is calculated and uh, by using the similar method of calculating European currency unit which was in existence before adoption of Euro. Now let me go into my uh, details of my study. Okay, so basically what I am trying to do is, I am trying to, uh, okay, uh, there are a series of other events that I missed out, such as the global financial crisis which took place in 2008. Now what happened after the global financial crisis? Almost all global economies uh, were affected by the global financial crisis. Now I am taking India into perspective. Now India is said to be a strong, the strongest economy in Asia because it was able to face through this crisis. But it had also certain adverse effects. And I am just taking two of the main effects which are exchange rate volatility. Indian rupee toppled down uh, since 2008. And then we also face a lot of increased inflation. And, infl and by inflation, I am focusing on imported inflation or exchange rate pass through. I am very sure that almost all of you know uh, how in, in, uh, increased import prices would lead to subsequent inflation in, uh, in our country. So that is in, in that light, what I am trying to do is, I am trying to suggest a solution and, as, uh, and of the many solutions, I am just taking this currency union as one solution. I am trying to see whether that is feasible, whether currency union can lead to exchange rate stability and decrease in imported inflation. So on that context, uh, I have stated my research problem as this. The research proposes to conduct a feasibility study on the adoption of Asian monetary unit by India and its implications on the overall business environment in India. So basically the problems addressed in the research are, as I said earlier, whether currency union is feasible in the ASEAN, ASEAN consists of 10 countries and uh, we have taken 6 other countries as well. And the reason why I have taken ASEAN plus 6 countries is because AMU wide is being calculated. In order to calculate AMU wide, the currencies of 16 countries have been taken which includes the 10 countries of ASEAN plus 6 other countries which include China, Japan, South Korea, India, New Zealand and Australia. So, uh, whether currency union is feasible in ASEAN plus 6 countries and if AMU can solve the problem and whether uh, AMU can solve the problem of exchange rate volatility and exchange rate pass through. Going to the next slide. I have stated my research objectives as the follows and two primary objectives. My first objective is to explore the feasibility of introduction of Asian monetary unit and its adoption in the Indian economic scenario. My second primary objective is to understand the implications of adopting AMU to the business environment in India. And for this, and, and the second primary objectives have been divided into two secondary objectives. And first one is to find out the extent to which India will be able to achieve exchange rate stability on adopting AMU against, uh, against that of the current rupee. And the second uh, secondary objective is to compare the extent to which India will be able to control inflation on adopting AMU against that of the current rupee. Now let me explain my objectives before going into the next slide. My first primary, as I said earlier, is 
the conducting the feasibility study. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the six countries, uh, countries whose currencies have been taken to com compute AMU wide, and I and I'm trying to see if these countries satisfy the optimal currency area theory uh, theory. And the second objectives, in order to uh, see what the implications of AMU are on the business environment, I have res I have restricted it to two variables, and one is exchange rate volatility and exchange rate pass through. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to compare the exchange rate volatility in case of AMU and the exchange rate volatility in case of rupee and I'm trying to compare them and see which is better or which has which is more stable. Similarly, in the second in the second secondary objective, what I'm trying to do is I'll be cal calculating the exchange rate pass through of the uh, of AMU, exchange rate pass pass through of rupee and I'll be com uh, comparing this, uh, the two. Now going to the next slide, my methodology. As said earlier, my population consists of 10 countries belonging to the ASEAN and, uh, and, uh, and uh, apart from that, Japan, South Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand and India will be taken. And as said, as said earlier, the reason why I have taken the 16 countries is because AMU wide is being calculated using the currencies of these 16 countries. My sample time period is from 2005 to 2015 and the source of data I am purely relying on secondary source of data and, uh, and I, uh, I aim to get the data from the World Bank's World Development Indicators and the national data regarding with respect to India will be obtained from uh, RBI and Ministry of Commerce and External Affairs. The calculations of AMU has been published in the uh, website of Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry uh, since 2005. Now, Time series analysis is proposed to be used and uh, I have arrived on this uh, on the basis of uh, literature review. The feasibility study of uh, the countries will be uh, countries included in the AMU wide as said earlier, I am trying to see if it, will, it satisfies the optimal currency area theory or not. And the variables considered for the feasible, uh, feasibility th study are extent of trade between the countries, symmetry of economic disturbances or activities, country specific characteristics such as monetary policy, political scenario, industrial growth index, correlation on growth, inflation, industrial output and demand and supply disturbances. And the tool proposed for conducting this feasibility study is vector auto regression model. Now to calculate the exchange rate volatility, GACH11 model is proposed. And to calculate the exchange rate pass through or imported inflation, vector error correlation model, uh, correction uh, model is proposed. And uh, till now, I have completed one year of my research and in this one year, I have reviewed over 25 articles and there is a restriction of literature review pertaining to uh, uh, Asian monetary unit. And uh, I have also published a paper relating to my research in the Commerce and Business uh, Researcher. I have also presented a paper in lines of my research in the Indian International Conference held in Philippines. I have also attended many national and international research methodology workshops. In the road, now in the road ahead, uh, I, I envision to complete my research, literature uh, review with this year and consequently and on the side I would also want to learn e econometrics as I come from commerce background, I don't have much insight into e econometrics. So that is a huge task ahead of me. I need to understand a lot of econometrics and uh, as, as uh, explained earlier, I have taken three models which are purely, uh, which are econometrics, vector econometric models. I need to understand that. And then I need to perfect my methodology. And in order to perfect my methodology, uh, I have taken up contacts of distinguished economic uh, professors. I have met uh, Usha Nori ma'am from uh, IPE and she is ex she is uh, offered to help me. Yes, thank you ma'am. And I have certain I have contacts with other economic professors, and I I uh, want to, I wish to I wish to uh, perfect my methodology and draft chapters on theoretical framework and literature review by the end of this year. And by next year, I want to conduct the data analysis, interpretation, and draft the research report. Uh, my first uh, query is that I have got a lot of suggestions, sir, uh, that I should include uh, previous literature on European Union. Uh, but my uh, my uh, the, the things that is con my conflicting th th thinking is that I have reviewed a few literature and uh, a, a few articles in research papers 
which has compared regionalism or economic integration in European Union with the economic integration uh, pattern in ASEAN. And the result of, and in the article they have concluded by saying that these two patterns are highly different. Where the regionalism in the European Union is purely politically uh, backed, while the regionalism in uh, ASEAN is economic, economically or trade backed. So, uh, which brings me to the question whether that uh, whether I should include Euro, uh, literature on European Union as it has no effect or no implications on uh, the economic integration that is going on in ASEAN. And uh, another question is that, uh, since, as I said earlier, since I come from commerce background, I really don't know how to go about with econometrics. Uh, I would like to get inputs as to how to take it and how to learn these methods as I'd like to do it on my own. And uh, a third question is, I've also got a lot of criticism saying that my research is purely constricted to uh, secondary data. And uh, from my point of view, I can't see how I can include primary data in my research. And uh, I would also like to know whether uh, including primary data, in what aspect I can include primary data if it's possible and how it will enhance my research. With this I come to the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Um, let me thank Institute of Public Enterprise for giving me this golden opportunity. I don't think I would have uh, been able to meet a lot of elite and really distinguished personalities of the academic pr uh, fraternity. So let me thank Kaiti, especially Janaki ma'am for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So well, this is a very ambitious topic. In the first place, I am tempted to congratulate you for venturing into an area like this. Since uh, you seem to be in the initial stages, it is natural, you know, to have so many things on the cards. And as you are also aware of, slowly you want to, or you may want to delimit the scope. So how you can go about doing this, etc., we will try to give you some clues. First, your question, the three questions, let me see whether I have to help you. See, the trying to establish parallelism between the European Monetary Union and the Asian Monetary Unit, um, actually there is no comparison. I think you are very much aware of that. There is no harm in studying the literature, but the tricky issue is trying to project this as a background to your study. You may review the studies only for the sake of information. Maybe it will give you some methodological clues. But it may not be directly relevant to your uh, area of your research. So from that point of view, you may try to reduce the time that you may like to spend on extensive survey of literature concerning European Monetary Union. That is one suggestion. Your second query regarding <coughs> the application of econometric tools, etc. My suggestion would be that you should not be very dependent. Uh, whether commerce or economics, these are two different labels. But essentially, you know, you are dealing with the uh, same subject. In fact, during your presentation, I never got any clue that you were a commerce student. It sounded as if uh, you have studied a lot of economics and all that. Even economics uh, students also use the same techniques which are relevant to this topic. This vector autoregressions, then associated with that is vector error correction and also the arch gauge type of models. So though there are certain refinements, Mm, which you may pick up at a later stage, it's not at all difficult to, you know, understand these things. I will also give you some clues how you can very quickly get into these things, okay? Then about the use of secondary data, it's not necessary that uh, everyone should uh, soil hands with primary data, 
okay as far as your topic is concerned there is very little scope for conducting primary so therefore it is perfectly justified if you go ahead with exclusively secondary data in my view i think uh, you should go ahead with that so these are possibly you know the answers to your questions except the second one which may need some elaboration which i would do after a little while coming to your research uh, formulation so you seem to be keen on the feasibility of adopting uh, asian monetary unit first i am not clear about what you mean by feasibility in the name of feasibility what exactly you want to do is not very clear but at the same time you have spelled out uh, that there is exchange rate volatility and because of that there is also inflation since price stability is the prime objective of uh, monetary and exchange rate policies how to really control exchange rate volatility is it possible to substitute in the place of exchange rate some asian monetary unit to what extent it to serve the purpose that if i am right uh, maybe your research concern actually what is your research concern from your presentation this is what i understand uh, but if this is different from what you have in mind you can spell it out uh, sir first thing i have taken a equation motor unit it's already calculated statistical tool it is just acting as a statistical tool right now so what i am trying to say is that uh, in asian region there will be some kind of economic in integration uh, in integration going on because uh, from in 2015 they have uh, they published this asian economic uh, economic community asian economic com community blueprint so it is on those lines that i am thinking that in future there will be economic integration in these 16 countries so if so they might adopt uh, asian monetary unit as a common currency so in that light i am trying to see that whether these 16 countries are suitable uh, to adopt a single currency and for that i have taken the optimal currency area theory uh, on my uh, past uh, review of literature i have come upon various articles where they have tried to see whether the european union the countries in the european union are whether they are feasible whether, whether they have uh, they are actually uh, satisfy the criteria of optimal currency area theory so similarly i have taken the same concept and i am trying to see whether these 16 countries are actually feasible whether they are actually suitable for a single currency can you uh, uh, can you go back to the statement of problem what sir is asking you is what is the question you have in mind when you said feasible what are you actually studying what is the question that you have uh, research question to go back this is go back to i don't understand monetary economics by the way that's not my subject i will be able to help some other i mean some students to, from other background but from the presentation what i understand and what what the professor kama has said is that is what is it that you mean by feasibility you zero it down to bring it down to a question then there can be some kind of dialogue yeah, let me continue with that actually <coughs> you want to examine whether the 16 countries that you have chosen whether they could form a kind of uh, monetary union on par with the european monetary union for which the basis has been uh, the optimal currency area theory i think it's very difficult to verify at this level not only for you but anybody to verify whether the these 16 countries would form a monetary union or a unit in consonance with 
the received optimal currency areas theory. That is very difficult for you at this level. But your other objectives, establishing the link between um, exchange rate volatility and inflation, that is possible. You can build a kind of <coughs> a small manageable model uh, using vector order regressions. That is feasible. So what happens when there is some kind of uh, shock in the volatility, how it uh, affects the inflation and also the other macroeconomic variables, that is very much feasible. Then you have clearly spelled out the Garch 1-1 model. The Garch 1-1 model is now, though it is well received in the literature, uh, it is somewhat uh, you know, old and outdated. There is software for computations. Uh, you can also experiment with uh, you know, quite a few other models. So my overall suggestion in this limited period for you would be to spell out in concrete terms your research questions, such as, for instance, establishing the link between exchange rate volatility and inflation by taking the actual data on exchange rate and inflation of the member countries, that is one. You can also replace the ex actual exchange rates by the Asian Monetary Unit for which data has been available. Okay? Then see whether there is any difference in the pattern. That is more concrete and you can think about that. Separately for measuring volatility, you can use Artigar's model. And for explaining the link between inflation and exchange rate quality, you can use vector order regression. I think for a PhD thesis, that would be sufficient. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. The next uh, presentation from uh, Agavati, Department of Commerce. Good morning everyone. I'm K. Bhagavati, PhD research founder, Department of Commerce, Periyar University, Salem, Tamil Nadu, under the guidance of Dr. K. Prabhakar Rajkumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Commerce, Periyar University, Salem, Tamil Nadu. Here my uh, research title is Impact of Foreign Direct Equity Inflows in India. So before going to present the paper, so in, uh, India is a good place to invest your money. So we have a lot of potential in our resource, like a uh, lot of manpower and uh, water, land. We have a lot of resource, but we are not able to put convert for the cap capital investments. So we have a problem. That's why uh, in 1991, since our Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has introduced the policy of new economic policy, and they are uh, introduced many policies like a foreign direct investment. First of all, uh, we have a lot of potential. India is the largest democracy, political stability and concerns of reforms. And the second one, liberal and transparent investment policies. And third one, fourth largest economic and public private policies safe for good due to your business. And the largest receiver for the skilled manpower and long term sustainable competitive advantages a high growth of rate, of rate of economy and first one introduction and this is my for uh, title and foreign direct investment first of all what is the use of foreign direct investment here what fdi okay, just keep over for judicious management of time i would suggest keep always because everyone knows what fdi go directly into your topic the question is statement of from there you will go up. Okay? Skip this slide. And this is my... Uh, and problem, problem statement, statement. Uh, don't read, uh, explain it as much as possible. It doesn't matter. This is, this is an exercise. This is a colloquium. This is an exercise. Student exercise. So don't read sentence by sentence. Explain. Uh, for everyone. This applies to everyone. First problem. Destination and location selection. Foreign companies and their countries that enter in the India, they are uh, how to select the exact place. So they are investing more amount of here 
they are confusing the how to select the exact places we are investing more amount of uh, we are enterprises the uh, their business unit here they are confusing the level of uh, selecting for the locations and it is, this is for a location selection how to they are maintaining their status unit the technological and infrastructure development they, uh, where are the skilled labor is there in wages level they are, uh, they are selecting their uh, location selection and second one prefer for more in, mode of investment so what is the investment is uh, very important to us the, they are uh, inv going to invest for the greenfield investment and brownfield investment they are uh, selecting for the uh, mode of investment and the most conditions and political stability and trade policies they are uh, very much upright to the Indian policy uh, policies and recommendations. So we have, uh, they are very much adapted to the economic policy and political stability and rule and law and microeconomics levels. Up. And last one, exchange rate volatility. They are, they are investing in the currencies here. Uh, they are, um, our exchange rate is uh, volatility. So the difference is of the your Indian currency, uh, Indian rupees and the foreign currencies. Up. And next one. This is my objectives of the study. Uh, still study the first objective is to study the overall India FDA is uh, in a post liberation in general. You know. So for 1991 since we have a lot of uh, FDA is received in, in India. So this is I uh, just find out the overall uh, FDA and second one uh, significance of the equity inflows. So what are the significance we have in the FDA in India? And third one to measure the country wealth and equity inflows in selected sector. So many many sectors in many countries is investing in particular sectors only. Why they are investing in that sectors only? So what are the developments that having in that sectors? That that is the third uh, uh, objective. And last one. Uh, so after the uh, foreign direct investment came to came to the India. So what are the benefits and the uh, economic development we have? So really we are developed or not? And uh, this is overall uh, Indian economics at last. This is my research group. Already uh, many of them uh, the completed in uh, this uh, foreign direct investment research. So I have to find out the some uh, uh, some important things only. So I am taking into consider for the equity investments, uh, in process in investment, and uh, uh, country wise uh, growth is uh, growth or development, and the sector wise. So they are uh, investing for particular sectors. So that's only the uh, after that the that sector is developed or not. That, uh, that sector is given to the con uh, given more contribution to FDI, uh, more uh, opportunity to uh, employment opportunities and uh, infrastructure development and skilled and manpower to the resources. And this is my methodology. So I have collected in uh, data in uh, Department of Industrial Promotion Policy Make in India, World Investment Re Reports, and the uh, Reserve Bank of India website onwards and the research analysis. And this is by country and sector by safety and process. So many countries, a lot of countries is investing in India. So this is the five, uh, top five and uh, top five sectors only. Top countries and the top sector size. So these are the influences came in India. First place is Indonesia, second place is Singapore, Netherlands, Japan, and US, the UK. So sector wise, so manufacturing sector is first one. And financial sectors, retail and wholesale trade, computer services and construction. So, so these are all the countries. Next. And some of the uh, some advantages having came to the foreign direct investment in India. So what are <coughs> next? Announcement. The for the rest of the presenters, I have a strong recommendation to make. By the time this presentation, this discussion concludes, please keep your statement of problem, research questions, methodology, and the and speak on that and make only those presentations. To start reading out and presenting paragraphs and paragraphs and pages, you will lose out precious time of uh, dialogue with Professor Tamaya. Uh, for your own benefit, uh, I would like you to be precise in what you want to ask here. Make use of his presence here, take notes, extensive notes. Sir. You have to take extensive notes and then leave the dais. Understand what I am saying? Okay. Ms. Bhagavati, uh, I have carefully listened to your presentation. It's an important topic. Um, but nevertheless, a few uh, comments I want to make. First, the importance of uh, 
FBI clothes. Actually, many people have done that. Since this is going to be a doctoral thesis, you should take it, you know, presenting something which is not there in the previous studies, as far as possible. Otherwise, what happens, it ends up repeating things which are already there in the literature. In which case, the value addition will be very less. Okay? Then you also, in your second <coughs> objective, want to explain the significance of FDA. That is also not very essential. Okay? Then third, you want to explain why investment flows occur only in certain sectors and why not in other sectors. Though it is a very relevant question, it has to be done with some uh, methodological rigor, which unfortunately you have not spent out. Perhaps you are in the initial stage of your research, if I understand. Then last question, uh, you want to examine the investment uh, capability of certain sectors and overall what is the impact of FDI flows on say the Indian economy. Okay? That is good enough. But for objectives three and four, we should spell out in concrete terms if you have any model in mind, if you have any specific methodology, etc. Database you are very clear. Uh, which is available and but what you will be doing with the database is not very clear. So therefore I would suggest that you work out on concretizing your objectives, especially objectives 3 and 4 and try to minimize discussion on objectives 1 and 2. Okay?